All right. You know what? We're gonna see Tumbleweed Jack. After two days' ride, you reach the town of Elko. It isn't all that much, just a few plank and timber buildings thrown up on both sides of the swiftly falling Humboldt River. Even so, just a few years ago, it was just cattle country that settlers and stagecoaches rolled through. But then the transcontinental telegraph got laid along these parts, and all of a sudden the sleepy little cattle crossing became important for keeping the little ticks and taps of the telegraph flowing east and west. The streets aren't half as dusty as Preston Springs, what with plenty of gravel mixed in from prospectorial mines. The usual bawdy saloons let their signs swing, but farther on down the playbills for an outdoor theatre are posted up. Okay, at the edge of things, a trio of storage sheds sit side by side while men trundle out fresh telegraph posts and bales of copper wire to string them along the trail. Down the other way lies a cluster of lean-tos, six-paced woodhouses and a flurry of tents that have shingles, some for doctors and such, hung up out front. The only structure of any solidity is a squat stone jail, set well off from everything else. A few discreet questions send you to Tumbleweed's new domicile. The jail is a dark little cave set just a stone's throw from the river, made of grey and crumbling stone that has many a crack stuffed with, with other crumbling slats of rock, the whole of it dribbling down into an ever-widening pile. It is also empty, but a steady thump on wood quickly draws you around to the rear. And there is Tumbleweed Jack, with an axe in hand and two cottonwood saplings before him. Oh, hey, Marshal, he calls out. I was hoping I'd run into you, or I'd not run, not quite. I've had some trouble, had some problems with what you wanted me to do. Uh, what did you do? It weren't my fault, Tumbleweed explains. I got drunk with them. Sounds very much like your fault. With them beer brothers, and they, well, I don't rightly know what happened, but they say I tried to jump the claim they got. Heck, it ain't even along the river. Why would I want to walk all the way up into the mountains day after day? I got some questions that need answers. Since you're a marshal, that means this is business. Tumbleweed grins as he sets aside his axe and takes a seat on an old and worn tree stump. And I swear I can smell a stew somewhere. Um, tell me what you know about Marshal James over in Preston Springs. What do I know? Not a lot, except he's dead and I... Well, it's best you know that I'm the one who pulled the trigger, and I got paid for it. But I reckon you want a bit more than that, uh, Tumbleweed says. If it were last, uh, it were last New Year's Eve when I done it. He stretches a leg. When he is ready, his words drip with regret. Now I ain't gonna say it was my proudest moment. I'd been watching the marshals, saw what hours he kept. Round near midnight, he broke up a drunken drawl in the Evening Star, and that meant he'd go back to the paperwork on it, justifying his drinking there. I'd expect. Anyway, I saw him go in through the front, and so I went around back, settled in at a notch where the wood had started to warp. I was quiet too, despite this cat that tried to trip me up. I peeked in on the marshal, found him scribbling away. He had a coffee pot on the stove, uh, being cold out, and so I waited until he got thirsty, then aimed right through the crack in the wall. It were a good shot, took him right down, and with every other fool firing their guns in celebration, no one came running. Uh, you were certain he was dead? I went in to check. He got it through the lungs, so he was done for, Tumbleweed explains. I was tempted to roll him over and take his badge, but I figured I'd best get going before my luck turned. My brother Brian wouldn't have wanted me to get caught avenging him, and so I left. When the ground thawed, they buried the body on Boot Hill. Nice coffin, too, not the cottonwood scrap they sometimes use. Um, do you remember where they buried him? Sure do, Tumbleweed notes. They put him in on the east slope of Boot Hill, facing the sun with alongside a couple of like-minded others. Did it right nice and deep with a pine marker to match. Eugene James, born and died. Now I see why he always went by his last name, because his first two were no great shakes. You ever run into a Marshal Steele? Can't say that I have. Tumbleweed shrugs and waits patiently for you to continue. Let's talk about what comes next for you. Let me be honest, Tumbleweed begins, and say that I'd like to be a free man just as much as anyone, and I'm willing to barter for it with what I know, or rather with what I haven't heard. Hmm... <laughs> yeah, sure. I, can, I can't promise for anything on account of what you've done, but I will do what I can to have you serve your sentence where you won't freeze for four months. I get you, Marshal, Tumbleweed says quietly. 
I was just hoping, well, hope is for horses. You know I got paid to kill marshals. It weren't much, though. Where I picked up my money was right here in Elko. And this time around, there weren't no envelopes waiting for me. No messages through the telegraph, neither. It's like they just pulled up stakes and left me behind. Guess they must have other plans, too. Other plans? You ruminate on that as you shake Tumbleweed's hand and leave the man to his work. Hmm... We'll find Yiska's office while we're here. Yiska's office isn't difficult to find, being one of the few six-pace houses, and furthermore marked with a storm-worn plank into which are carved the words Yiska Navajo Shoshone, Indian lawyer. The door is half open. It seems the man himself is in. Hmm. We'll wait a moment and study the office. It is a modest affair all around. One door, two windows, and a little pipe stove whose iron chimney pokes out the top. Must be cold in the winter. Footsteps, the door opens in full to reveal a young couple in Sunday bests. Black jacket, white shirt, and red bout, bow tie for the whiskerless fellow. A bonnet with matching blue dress for the pretty young thing at his side. Iska himself wears a button-down shirt and long tie. A pair of polished black shoes runs out the loyally ensemble. His handsome native features, proud and potent as the nearby mountains, are flushed with ready wits as he directs his clients off. Don't forget, go see the justice of the peace straight away and get his mark. He reminds the pair. As they depart, he notes you. Those were Mr. and Mrs. George Gantz. Or they will be once they get properly married. As it turns out, Tahoma, a saloon keeper, can't join two people in matrimony, no matter how much whiskey everyone drinks. Yiska guides you into his cramped office. Six steps in lie a pair of broad, broad shelves, so laden with books that the oak has begun to bow. At the far end rests a big wooden desk topped by a stack of thick papers and a steel-tipped reservoir pen that must have come a long way. A half-filled ink bottle and eyedropper for the same rests on a low shelf nearby. He invites you to sit in one of the two chairs opposite his desk. Takes the other opposite you. <laughs> Start romance. Um, no. I may be in a bit of a bind concerning a second marshal. Yiska listens attentively as you lay things out. As you conclude, he leans back in his chair and muses for a long moment. Interestingly, your answers may be close at hand, he says after a moment. Please allow me a little while to find the relevant passages for a precise recitation. Yiska takes up a thin volume entitled The United States Constitution from his library shelf. After a brief read, he extracts another tome entitled Judiciary Acts, 1789 to present. A simple flip of those crisp pages draws forth a serious nod. Okay. Waiting patiently. After a time, he taps the page. I have an answer. Bear with me while I lay it out for you. Yiska lays the book out before you. The page he taps is entitled Judiciary Act of 1789. U.S. Marshals were one of the first things set down by the founders of America. They acted primarily as federal representation within the states. Because of this, all appointments to the post are made by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Now I know you haven't been confirmed. No one has owing, no one has owing to detentions in Washington right now. Iska explains as he settles into his chair. After the assassination of Abraham Lincoln by the actor John Wilkes Booth, well, things got thrown into turmoil because nobody expected Vice President Johnson to be anything other than a drunk waiting in the wings. Um, so I haven't been confirmed and I'm not a marshal. Well, when this Marshal James you spoke of filled out your paperwork, he said it made you a provisional marshal. That is not quite accurate. You are more of a deputy, and that is something which he, as an appointed marshal, is legal, legal, legally capable of bestowing. Yiska explains. Um, then this Marshal Steele. I will approach that presently, Yiska says. What about him? I honestly do not know the man, but chances are that someone else does. You know someone I should ask? Indeed, I know a man who can help. He's been just about everywhere and has brushed elbows with just about everyone. I'm speaking of Dan Schmidt, of course. Is he still around? I've not seen him since the Red Ribbon Affair. Yiska says. I thought he might have gone out Wyoming way for way gone out Wyoming way for the annual buffalo hunt. Hmm. What is the trouble in Washington? I would say the usual nails in a horse's hoof, but this time it's different. This time the Republican Party is tearing itself apart. The more moderate Johnson is at loggerheads with his own party over the issue of Reconstruction and other aspects pertaining to the now disbanded Confederacy, Iska explains. And because of this, the party is fast approaching a cliff and neither side seems eager to quit. 
Much of the work of Congress, marshals included, is being delayed out of spite. You hesitated there when talking about John Wilkes Booth? Well, I knew the Booth family. That is to say, I knew his older brother June from my brief stay in San Francisco and then met the more celebrated Edwin Booth in New York. Yiska explains. They come from an acting family, heir to the legacy of Junius Brutus Booth. And I can tell you understand the Brutus reference vis-a-vis -vis the assassination of Julius Caesar nearly two millennia ago, but I, I digress. Yes, I knew Edwin and June Booth, good men, though only Edwin has his father's genius when he takes the stage. To watch the man portray Iago or Richard III is to be thrown back into that very time as spectator. Sad how John Wilkes turned out, but certain causes make men do strange and terrible things. What does this mean for Marshall Steele and myself? That is the question, Yiska nods. There is no law that says only one Marshall per county. That is merely custom and precedent. It could be broken any number of ways. Delays in receipt of letters, for example, though that is less prevalent now with the telegraph. I suggest you proceed with caution, for neither of you are on solid ground. Now, I hate to be a bother, especially to a client, but I also have other clients who have been waiting longer. He ushers you to the door and offers the usual farewells as you step out. Sure, we'll visit the con transcontinental telegraph station. The telegraphy shack isn't much. Solid pine wood walls house a place where the copper wires dips down, slides, uh, slips in one side, and then wanders out the other. Modest by all appearances, but the soft rhythmic clacks that tumble out the door are a harbinger of great change that began just five years past. A message can be sent from New York to San Francisco in a matter of hours instead of months. This is what truly brought California into the sisterhood of states, instead of remaining an isolated paradise. The door to the shack opens and a young bespec spectacled man steps out. Twenty and some years with only a hint of whiskers, he eases out a cigar and prepares to nip the end with a knife. Hmm. You there, I'm Marshall Smith and I need to use the telegraph. Of course you do, he replies. I'm Martin Baldwin, by the way, so how urgent is your need? Hmm. Finish your cigar, if you like. Most kind. Martin nods, then strikes a match and waves it under the tip of his cigar. The young man gives a puff of his cigar, turns a little green and nearly retches up. <laughs> Don't die on me, I've got questions. Trying, Martin managed to get out, but it ain't as easy as it looks. The end of the cigar is snuffed by a pinch of fingers, and the tobacco length retreats into a little wooden case in his pocket. Say, aren't you the one who took down the red ribbon dam? Martin asks. <laughs> Just stare at him. Hey, not saying anything about it, especially not with the rivers running, right? Martin puts in. What can I help you with? Uh, I'd like to send a message. That is what I'm here for, Martin replies, then dons a tidy little blue cap to mark his official transformation from bespectacled fella to telegrapher. He takes out a pad of paper and readies a pen to write down what you want to say and where it need to go. Hmm. Hmm. To Washington, to President Johnson. Ooh. Um. Hmm. Yeah, I need to contact Marshal James. Marshal James. Martin says as he writes, common name. Hope there's not more than one. Uh, the Department of the Treasury, Washington, D.C., Best title it to the Secretary of Treasury, Treasury himself. That way they'll look at it quick, Martin says as he jots down your request. And a message to President Johnson? Martin raises an eyebrow. President Johnson, eh? Well, you are a marshal, so I guess that makes sense. Mind you, from the chatter I've heard, he's not going to be, but be particularly quick on the response. That's fine, that's why I'm sending the message now. Uh, need to contact Carson City and arrange to have Tumbleweed Jack put in the prison there before winter comes and kills him. Can do. Martin nods and marks down your words. Another fella headed over to Bunk in Carson City. The, Be the Beard Brothers will be glad to hear that. They're still nursing their bruises from their last clash with old tumbleweed. Ah, uh, now we're done here. Alright, remember, it doesn't take long for the message to get there, but you might be waiting a while for a reply. Martin says then dips the shiny zinc electrodes down into the blue solution of copper sulfate. A snap and tingle fills the air like the morning before a storm. The taste of copper clings to the inside of your mouth for an instant and vanishes with a swallow. Almost immediately afterward, the register begins to tick down from the eastern wires, coding out a message to be relayed. No rest for the wicked, Martin notes as he adjusts his build cap ever so slightly and returns to his neighbor, labor.
The reply from Carson City comes pretty quick. Prisoner transfer approved. Stop. Deliver via stagecoach. Stop. November at latest. End. Tumbleweed, Tumbleweed will no doubt be pleased at this turn of events, or at least he'll be better fed. The answer from Marshal James comes after a few hours, or at least someone claiming to be him. You can't be certain after all. Your message not understood. Stop. You are Marshal for Lander County. Stop. Be wary. Stop. Be confident. End. That is clear enough, if not especially helpful. We'll wait a bit longer. You spend night in Elko, waken to the lo lowing of cows and the crisp clacking of the telegraph shack. Before you can gulp, gulp down a bit of trail bread and think to boil coffee, Martin steps out and waves you over with a crisp telegram in hand. You're gonna like this. At the bottom of the page is the name Hugh McCulloch, Secretary of Treasury and above it lie the words. Your message received. Stop. Several marshals named Steele have been appointed. Stop. None for Lander County. Stop. Marshal of Lander County remains vacant. Stop. Appointment of Calamity Smith pending. End. And there you have it. Bright as the coming day. We'll wait a bit longer. You wait and wait. Lunch comes round, then supper. Martin returns to his shift at the telegraph and takes over for a man with hairy mutton chops. Finally, Martin steps out of the shack and waves you over. A crisp telegram rests in his hand. I can't believe you actually replied in person. The message reads, Marshal Smith, I have received your message and reviewed same. Stop. Discrepancy concerning your pending appointment and Mr. Steele is troubling. Stop. Secretary of Treasury McCulloch informs me that you are slotted for appointment to Lander County. Stop. Other Marshal is not pending for Lander County. Stop. Suggest your arrest miscreant at earliest convenience. End. There at the bottom of the simple single page are the words Andrew Johnson. Press US. Plain as day. Martin follows you out into the street and shadows your step for several paces, before at last he clears his throat to speak. Can I ask what you're going to do, Marshal? He wonders as the telegraph re register clacks on behind the two of you. I mean, this is going to get spread around quickly. Now, a lot of people are going to want to know what is coming. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it has to be settled and settled right, that's for certain. Justice plays no favorites and the law serves all men, Martin says then steps back toward his shack with an eager twitch of fingers. And now we're heading back. Two days later you ride back into Preston Springs. Late at night you rise from your blankets as thunder booms. The sky is a dark tapestry as lightning flashes from midnight clouds to dance atop jagged mountain peaks. A harsh wind begins to blow and brings it with it a drizzle of cold rain. Something behind you, a snap turns, finds only darkness. Your throat grows tight, an itch creeps through your jaw, but a swallow goes nowhere. Hot white lightning bursts close at hand and sets the ground to roiling beneath your feet. As your vision clears, a hooded figure all in black appears before you with a far too familiar twist of rope in hand. The executioner almost casually loops the, nose about your, the noose about your neck as if it had never left. Cut the noose. Your knife all but leaps into hand. With a single slash you free yourself. But the figure darts in and grasps up the shorter end. Then as if it has all the time in the world, it pushes back its hood. The paunchy features of Marshal Steel are revealed. His head tilts too sharply to one side and you catch sight of silvery strings stretching on up into the roiling sky. The puppet strings twitch and Steel's head rights itself. Then his thumbs gorge out your eyes. With a start, you awaken to a quiet land. That strange memory of Marshall Steele plays over and over again in your mind as dawn light fills the eastern sky. Hmm. Hmm. You were a puppet, not a person. Nothing I could say to him mattered. Persuasion increased. You just know the dream means something. Something terrible. Something that is coming. Hmm. I'll talk to Schmidt, not necessarily because of Marshal James, but because I want to know more about Marshal Steele. It doesn't take long to find Schmidt in line at the Assayers. His little bags of gold dust wait to become a more ready fortune of coins or local script. The big prospector idly shifts his feet as the line eases forward. A small sack rests in his mighty hands. His hair is a wind-blown ruffle that goes right along with dirty nails and mud-flecked boots. As you step behind him, he turns, around, uh, he turns toward you and blinks. Calamity. Hey, what brings you by? Uh, any chance I can chat with you for a few? Sure, this line ain't going nowhere, Schmidt replies and steps out of line. Uh, have you ever heard of a Marshal Steele? Several of them, Schmidt says. 
any from near here? Nearest would be Phil Steele up in Oregon. After that, Roger Steele out of Texas, though he worked a lot in Arizona. Schmidt recalls the line as the line shuffles on. Either of them dead? Phil got struck by lightning, fell in a river, and eventually died of pneumonia. Roger retired, though, at least that was the word. Schmidt shrugs. I think he went over to New Orleans, of all things. Um, can I just call you Dan? Yeah, I like that calamity. Dan replies earnestly. Um, ever known a county with two marshals? It happens, Dan relates as the line inches forward. One marshal going out, another coming in. If it's a long ride, they sometimes overlap. But if things were bad or about to get bad, well, maybe then. But I expect they could just take on deputies, Dan says and scratches his head. Don't take that as gospel, though. I mean, lawman is one job I never held for long. It was all file this and write that. Didn't help that I kept snapping the pans. Uh, Marshal by the name of James, you ever talk with him? Sure, plenty of times. When they put me up for sheriff, sheriff, he came and we emptied a bottle together. Dan recalls. The things he told me were half the reason I didn't want the job. And what do you know about the death of him? Shame what happened to him. But one morning they found him face down in his office back just after New Year. Cold as the coffee on his stove. Strange thing was all his papers were missing. He'd been shot in the back, probably at midnight, when everyone else was shooting off their guns. We buried him out on Boot Hill when the weather broke for a bit. Preston and I sprung for a share of the coffin. Nice little pine box. You remember where it is? Sure, I'll head on out with you, Dan offers. Now I have to think. Dan begins, but a sudden ruckus from the front of the line cuts the congeniality to ribbons. You're a thief and a liar. Young Billy Tate declares in fluffing terms, then jabs a black calf-skin-covered finger at the bald top to say her. It's worth twice that. Perhaps to a blind man in San Francisco, the assayer replies coolly. Between them a pile of gold bits lies on one scale, while another holds little lead weights. The balance between them is perfect, but the fan of local script in the assayer's hands seem a little small. Hmm. Yeah, step forward, see what is the matter. It's fevery, Marshal, Billy says as he step forward, plain and simple. I'm afraid not, sir. I have weighed it and taken into account the impurity of the sample. The sayer counters then looks meaningfully to you. <laughs> Whack Billy in the back of the head. Sorry, Billy, but the sayer has spoken. If you think you're being cheated, go elsewhere. You ain't seen the last of me, Billy says as he waggles a finger at the sayer. But the stoic man gets that a lot and just motions forward the next customer. That settled, you head on out to Boot Hill with Dan alongside. It isn't a long way, it's just out in the east away from the river. A little rise amid so many other slopes, hardly imposing at all except for the numerous grave markers that dot the crest. There are more than you expected, given the recent founding of the town. Not a lot of proper tombstones either, just wooden planks carved up and stuck into the ground with a few crosses here and there. Whoever played mortician must have skimmed off a pretty penny. Dan gestures towards the hill. The marshal was buried on the backside. We figured he'd like to see the sunrise. Loose gravel and sparse grass fall under your gruelous hooves as you start up the slope. A scattering of graves lie ahead. There's an old Indian cairn with tattered remnants of feathers and animal bones, a set of matching plank markers whose painted faces have long faded, and a big stone that is half carved with the face of a cherub to mark the way up. Your horse whinnies sharply as it nearly stumbles into an empty grave. Once the beast is back under control, you read the wood plank tombstone above the yawning opening. Marshal Eugene James, born June 4th, 1828, died January 1st, 1865. A good man never gives up. Dan rides forward, exclaims, Sweet merciful mother, he's gone. Huh, someone dug it up before I could. You slip on down to the ground and ponder what you don't have and can't get. Dan casts a wary glance at you. I think that we should have a talk about the things you can't do and the things you shouldn't. Hmm. Examine the edges of the grave. There's a good bit of grass grown round the edges, certainly high enough for your horse to nearly stumble into it. There's also thick grave moss and a few desiccated mottle-gilled mushrooms besides. Those dust-brown banded caps mean that the grave has been this way for a while, likely since mid-spring, else they wouldn't have had water or wood to grow. Okay, reach into the grave and feel around. Hard, slick clay slides between your fingers as you poke around. Bits of wood, splinters really, are all around. Then you feel something round. A penny, no two of them. Each dirty but not rusted. Coppers for the ferryman, Dan intones quietly. Guess someone didn't need them. 
take a closer look at the grave marker. It is a simple piece of wood, carved out of a cottonwood tree, but the name of Marshal Eugene James and his date of death are noticeably more weathered than the epitaph on the bottom. Indeed, a good man never gives up is done up in thick charcoal and not paint at all, with rubbings along the ground that reveal it was added after the grave marker was already long in place. Hmm, enough of this. Head back to town. Yeah, let's get back, Dan says. I'll be out drinking, but you, you need me for something, just say the word. It is a thoughtful ride back into town. Hmm. Sure, go, let's go see Miss Carraway.